A New Beginning presents a timely book from Pastor Greg Laurie called God's Answer to Fear, Anxiety, and Worry. God can help you in your times of anxiety and fear. There are specific passages that can bring comfort and perspective to you. And trust me, everything that I am talking about has been tested in my life in real time. So I hope you'll order your own copy of God's Answer to Fear, Anxiety, and Worry. Yours for a gift of any amount at harvest.org. You cannot control what comes your way in life. I've tried, but I can control my reaction to it. I can control the way I think. The Bible tells us the rain falls on the just and unjust alike. But Pastor Greg Laurie says we have the mind of God to help us through. Paul says, I found it. I found the secret to contentment, and I want to share it with you. The secret of contentment is found in the way a believer thinks. This is the day when the lost are found. This is the day for a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Again, you hear all the angels are singing. This is the day, the day when life begins. It would seem that it's easy to be content when things are going well. And it's easy to be discontented when life has brought us to our knees. But is our contentment always tied to our circumstances? Pastor Greg Laurie would remind us that some of Paul's most encouraging words were written from a dank, dark prison cell. Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg helps us see how to have a spirit of contentment no matter what life throws our way. It's part of his series called Worldview. So let me begin with a question. How many of you would describe yourself as a happy and content person? Go ahead and raise your hand. You're happy, you feel you're happy and content. It's not everybody. Uh, I think there's always that thought that, well, I will be eventually, you know. When this happens, I'll be content, but not quite yet. You know, when you're single, you're thinking, If only I was married, I know I would be content. I'm so tired of of being single. I'm so tired of being in the restaurant and having them saying, party of one, you know. I, I just, I wanna get married. And then you get married. And you understand the truth of that statement that marriage is a three ring circus, engagement ring, wedding ring, and suffering. So you say, well, We need kids. If we had children, I know I'd be content then. Then you have children. And they're still living with you in their 50s. And you're thinking, (laughs) how can I get rid of these children? I know. Maybe I just need a new wife or husband. I need to trade mine in on the new model. And so you get remarried. And then you say, oh man, my old spouse was better than my new spouse. I wish I could go back and marry them again. And then you go on a little bit in life and you say, oh, retirement. It's all about retirement. I know when I'm retired, I'll be content. And then you're retired. And you're thinking, man, I miss work. I need something to do. I wish I could go have my old job back again. See, it's always beyond your reach. It's the if only river that separates you in your mind from the good life. If only this, if only that. Reminds me of a story I read about a wealthy employer who once heard one of his employees say to another, if I had a thousand dollars, I'd be perfectly content. So this man stops, turns around and says, excuse me, you know, I have a lot of money and I've never found contentment from my money, but I want to meet a perfectly contented person. So here you go. Pulls out his checkbook, writes it out, thousand dollars, signs it, this is yours. And as he walks away, he overheard that employee say, why didn't I ask for two thousand? See, that's the way we are. That's human nature. But know this, getting more stuff will not bring happiness or contentment. There's one psychologist who did a lot of study on what brings contentment, and her conclusion was, quote, if people shoot for a certain level of affluence, thinking it will make them happy, they find that upon reaching it, they become very quickly habituated, and at that point they start 
hankering for the next level of income, property, or good health. So, you know, you make thousands, but oh, if only I were a millionaire. Then you're a millionaire. If only I were a billionaire. I read someone say the other day, a very wealthy person, a billionaire, it won't be long till we meet a trillionaire. So, you know, it's always beyond your reach. You're never quite there on your own. Well, here's a man who writes this epistle, Philippians, the Apostle Paul, who tells us he has found the secret to contentment. Everybody likes to hear a secret. Have you ever been in a restaurant, maybe your table's close to one next to you, and, and you're not really eavesdropping, but you hear a word or, or two there, and then one of the people says to the other, I want to tell you a secret. Suddenly you lean in. <laughs> you don't know these people from Adam's house kept them in. You want to hear the secret. Then they reveal the secret about someone you've never heard of and you don't care about, but the secret. We love to know the secret. Paul says, I found it. I found the secret to contentment and I want to share it with you. What's interesting is Paul was in adverse circumstances when he wrote this. He wasn't kicking back on some beach in the Mediterranean eating a falafel. He was under house arrest. He was a prisoner of Rome. He was facing an uncertain future. He did not know if he would be acquitted or beheaded. Yet in this epistle that he writes to the church of Philippi that we call Philippians, he talks a lot about joy, rejoicing, happiness, and contentment. And we ask, how is that possible? The answer is found in a word that Paul uses over and over in this epistle, and it's the word mind. He uses the word mind ten times. He also uses the word think five times. Add to that the time he uses the word remember. And you have 16 references to the mind which brings us to the simple point. The secret of contentment is found in the way a believer thinks. It's not found in the way a believer feels. Because our emotions fluctuate, don't they? You know, sometimes everything's going well. Your health is good. The bills are paid. Uh, everything's going the way you hoped it would go and you find yourself in depression. And you're saying, why am I down in the dumps right now? There's no logic to it. So we don't base it on the way that we feel. We base contentment on the way that we think. Which brings us to our text, Philippians chapter four. And we're reading verses 10 to 13. Paul writes and he says, For I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity, not that I speak in regard to need. For I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. Underline that verse. I've learned whatever state I'm in to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is so important. We think, no, if I had a nicer car, if I had a bigger house, if I had a, a, a larger salary, or if I had a new face or a new body, or if I had what that person is eating. Have you ever noticed that when you go to a restaurant, you want what the other person has, or is this just me? You know, when I go out and order, I was with a group of people the other day, and I said, what are you ordering? And they, oh, that sounds good. And then, what are you ordering? Oh, I might get that. I can't. Oh, what are you ordering? So then I order whatever thing I order. And then the food arrives, and man, their food looks so much better than mine. They can tell by the way I'm looking at it. I'm just staring. Would you like a bite of my food? Yes, I would. <laughs> Why is it that stolen food always tastes better? You know, maybe you're out in a restaurant and you're trying to lose weight so you order a kale salad with tofu and dirt and rocks or whatever you're eating. <laughs> and your friend orders a big, fat, juicy cheeseburger with all the fixings and, yeah, okay, it's good. <laughs> you, sir, are a glutton. No, I'm kidding. You, sir, are a man after my own heart. That's who you are. So, uh, so you order, you know, they order that big burger and, and you're just looking at it and you're saying, could, could, I, could I have maybe one of your fries? And, and they give you a fry and it's like the most amazing fry you've ever eaten. <laughs> but then if you notice, and you, if you order fries, they're not as good. Stolen food is better. And by the way, let me just say this. I'm going to tell you a story, something that just happened to me uh, when I was over in Hawaii. Uh, and, but, but 
I want to tell you girls something. It's very important for you girls to know this. Guys don't like to share their food. Okay, just know that. <laughs> guys, am I right? So girls, you say, no, Greg, you're wrong. My husband shares his food. I didn't say he won't share it. I said he doesn't like it. <laughs> we tolerate it, but we don't like it. We don't like your little forks coming our way. <laughs> My wife would say, can I have a bite of what you're eating? I'll say, go ahead. <laughs> and her little fork comes in, and first it cuts whatever I'm eating, you know, a piece of chicken, fish, whatever. And then she dips it here and goes over here and grabs a little. And it takes like years. I'm just sitting there like, I can't get to my food. This little invading fork is moving around. And then I'll be like say eating that burger and I've got the last bite. I love the last bite of the burger. And you're getting ready to eat and my wife says, can I have a bite? I'm just like. <laughs> then I remember, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Sure. My hand's shaking. So anyway, just wanted to establish that principle. Guys don't like to share food. Think of a dog eating food out of a dish. That's a man having a meal. You go and put your hand near the dog, it might get bitten off. Okay, so I'm in a restaurant in Hawaii. Over there with our church, Harvest Kumalani. I'm with uh, Dave and with Steve. And they're friends. And so we all order. And uh, so Steve ordered a sandwich. Dave ordered something else. So we're talking. And uh, all of a sudden Dave says to Steve, can I have a bite of your sandwich? <laughs> uh, kind of different. I mean. And I, and I, now if a guy asked me for a bite of my sandwich, I would say, okay. And I'd set it down. I'd get out my fork and my knife. And I'd cut him off a piece where I had not eaten the sandwich. And I would put it on a plate. And I'd give it to him. Here you go. So he says, Dave says to Steve, can I have a bite of your sandwich? And without pausing, Steve says, sure. And takes his sandwich. And Dave takes his sandwich out of Steve's hand. Out of, out of his hand. And he takes a bite where Steve had been eating. I was horrified. And I stopped everything. I said, wait, stop everything. You just traumatized me. They're like, what? Dave's like, you know. And then I said, Dave, I've got to use that in a sermon. He goes, go for it. And I did. Just like I did here. And, uh, but the point is, if there's something desirable about something someone else has. More than what you have. And that's why we need to learn to find real contentment. What do we do if we can't change our circumstances? How do we find contentment when life is challenging? Well, Pastor Greg answers that in just a moment. Hey everyone, I want you to know about our app called Harvest Plus. Think of it as a harvest version of Netflix. We have all of our resources in one place. We have our movies like Steve McQueen, The Salvation of an American Icon, Johnny Cash, The Redemption of an American Icon, A Rush of Hope, and much more. Then we have our television program, daily devotions, and much more. So go and download the Harvest Plus app. Well, today, Pastor Greg is helping us find real contentment, contentment that transcends what this world has to offer. You know, as I said, Paul was in difficult circumstances when he wrote this. These are not theories from an ivory tower. This is from the school of hard knocks. Paul had experienced pleasure and health and also sickness and weakness. He had highs. He had lows. He was a hero to some. He was a villain to others. But he learned this. Contentment does not just come because we've conquered our circumstances, but rather because we've learned to live with them. Let me say that again. Contentment does not come because we've conquered or changed our circumstances, but rather because we've learned to live with them. Heard about a story of a man who was very proud of his perfectly groomed front lawn. It was flawless. But then a heavy crop of dandelions appeared seemingly out of nowhere. He tried everything he could to get rid of them and had no success. So he actually shot off an email to the School of Agriculture telling them of all the things that he had tried to get rid of the dandelions. And he said, what do I do now? Here was their response. We suggest you learn to love dandelions. <laughs> you know, that's how it works sometimes. Lord, I want you to take this away. I want you to change it. Lord says, I suggest you learn to love them. 
this unruly husband. Lord, I've tried everything. Learn to love him. This wife that won't do what I want her to do. This wife that takes my food constantly from my plate. I'll learn to love her. These kids that were great until they hit the teen years and I don't know what's happening. Oh yes, learn to love them. Because life's going to give you those things that you cannot control. So that brings me to point number one if you're taking notes. Contentment comes when we rejoice in the Lord. Paul found contentment because he rejoiced in the Lord. Verse four of Philippians four he says, Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. And by the way that's a command as we pointed out in our last message. You're commanded to rejoice. It doesn't say rejoice in circumstances because sometimes it's hard. But rejoice in the Lord. Studies have actually linked gratitude with a variety of positive effects in one's life. It's been determined that grateful people demonstrate less envy, materialism, and self-centeredness. Gratitude enhances relationships, longevity of life, and even your quality of sleep. If it came in a pill form, gratitude would be a miracle cure. Just learning to be thankful for what you already have instead of what you think will make you happy. So Paul writes in verse 11, I found in whatever state I'm in to be content. Now think about your own life right now. Can you learn to love what you have instead of what you don't have? You know, Paul again is under house arrest. He's in a jail cell instead of having his freedom. He has four walls around him instead of a mission field. Yet he's content. Which brings us to this point. What you have in Christ is far greater than anything you don't have in life. Let me say that again. What you have in Christ is far greater than anything that you don't have in life. You have Jesus. Therefore you have everything you need for now and eternity. That's important. And Jesus has you. And that makes all the difference in the world. Now let's not misunderstand this. Paul's not saying that we should necessarily be satisfied with our present spiritual condition. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are happy with where you are at spiritually right now? Raise your hand up. No, that's some of your hand. That's good. I, I didn't, my hand's not up. I'm not happy with where I'm at. What, you're not happy in your relationship with God? Very happy. But what I'm saying is, I have a long ways to go. I have a lot to learn. I need to know the Bible much better than I know it. I need to be more Christ-like than I am right now. I've already shared how selfish I am with food. <laughs> now, there's so much growth I need in my life, and I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that as a good thing. A true mark of growing spiritually is knowing you need to keep growing spiritually. That, that indicates that you really are in a state of growth. Paul writes in Philippians 3, Friends, I'm not all that I should be. I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God through Christ has called me. No, we should not be satisfied with where we're at in that sense. But having said that, we should find contentment in our relationship with God. But that's not our nature. Notice Paul says, I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. Some things have to be taught. Children are not naturally mannerly. They're naturally selfish and inconsiderate. And you have to teach a child. Matters. When I see a naughty child, I attribute it to a delinquent parent. Not doing their job right. Not teaching a child. You don't do that sort of thing. You don't say that sort of thing to someone. That is not acceptable. So in the same way, contentment needs to be learned. It's not natural because I'm not naturally content. Uh, take a child, put them in a room, give them a toy. They're relatively happy. Bring in another child with another toy. Friction begins. Right? Now they're fighting over one toy that they have determined is the best toy. They're pulling on both sides of it. it. It could even be a little bunny. They'll pull it apart if you don't stop them. They want what the other person has. That's human nature. And we don't necessarily outgrow that. But Paul says, listen, I've learned this. I've learned this secret that I want to share with you. The secret of contentment. Point number two. 
Paul found contentment because he took life as it came. Paul found contentment because he took life as it came. Look at verse 12. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Here's another translation. Just listen to this. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm happy with little as much as I'm happy with much or with much as I am with little. I found the recipe for being happy whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. You cannot control what comes your way in life. I've tried. It doesn't work. But I can control my reaction to it. I can control the way I think. I can control my attitude. That's why you learn this. You learn how to be content. Which brings me to point number three. Contentment does not come from what I have. It comes from who I know. Contentment does not come from what I have. It comes from who I know. Hebrews 13, five says, let your way of life be without covetousness. The word covet means a greedy desire to have more no matter what it costs you or someone else. It's from a word that can be translated to pant. To pant like an animal pursuing its prey. Uh, Let your life be without covetousness. But then he goes on to say, but be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. See, because Christ will never leave me, I can be content. It's not about what I have. It's about who has me. It's about this relationship I have with God that can bring the ultimate contentment. That is why David wrote in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. You know when the Lord your shepherd you can find this perfect contentment. Contentment is found in making the most of the least. And so Paul had found this contentment in his relationship with God. Great insight today here on A New Beginning. Pastor Greg Laurie is showing us the Bible's prescription for finding contentment, no matter what's going on in our lives. And there's more to come as Pastor Greg continues this study. It's called The Biblical Worldview on Finding Contentment. And then, uh, Pastor Greg, I know you had a further word you wanted to share. So as you've been listening today, maybe you've thought to yourself, man, I wish I had this relationship with God that is being talked about? Well, you can. He's only a prayer away. You see, becoming a Christian, it doesn't take years. It doesn't take months. It doesn't take weeks. It it doesn't even take hours. It can happen in a moment. The Bible describes it as turning from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. But before that happens, the Bible says you need to have your eyes open. And here's the amazing thing. It's just like in a flash A light goes on and you say, this is all true. That's how it happened for me. I just heard the gospel and all of a sudden I realized this is all true. And maybe you've realized that as well. Let me ask you, would you like Jesus Christ to come into your life? Would you like him to forgive you of your sin? Would you like this relationship with God we've been talking about today? If so, why don't you just pray a simple prayer with me? You could pray it out loud if you like, but Say this to God, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I turn from my sin and I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and friend. Thank you for hearing this prayer. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, did you just pray that prayer? If so, I want to send you at no charge what we call a new believer's Bible. Here's Dave to tell you more. And let me just say, congratulations. You've made the right decision. Yeah, that's right. And and listen, to help you begin to live this new life, this life where you're at peace with God and can begin to enjoy the peace of God, let us send you Pastor Greg's New Believer's Bible. It's the perfect resource for someone who's new to the faith. We'll send it free of charge if you'll just contact us and request it. 
Call 1-800-821-3300. That's 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org and click No God. And then let us take a moment to thank you for praying for this ministry and for supporting it through your generous donation. It's an investment in kingdom business. Isn't that right, Pastor Greg? Yeah, it's really true, Dave. And I believe it's so important because, you know, the gospel saves lives. It saves eternal lives because when a person believes in Jesus, according to Scripture, they pass from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. And then, of course, that changes the course of their future. That impacts their children and their children's children. The gospel changes everything. And thousands and thousands of people respond every single year. Thanks to the Lord. Also, thanks to you for your investment in this ministry, enabling us to reach people wherever they are. So if this is something you care about, I encourage you to make a financial investment and a new beginning in Harvest Ministries. Yeah, that's right. And we really do appreciate your support. Thanks for partnering with us today. It can make a real difference, not just for today or this week, but for eternity. So get in touch with your support today by calling 1-800-821-3300. That's a 24-7 phone number, 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514, or go online to harvest.org. Well, next time, more great biblical insight on finding contentment in a frustrating world. Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher, Greg Laurie.